Tim Donaghy was at the top of his game. A referee in the National Basketball Association, he loved the limelight, was considered one of the NBA's better refs, and was making almost $300,000 a year. But he was also living a secret life. During the last four years of his 13-year career, he committed a personal foul. He betrayed the fans and the league by betting on NBA games, including some he was officiating. Donaghy won about 75% of his bets, an incredible percentage confirmed by the FBI. Tonight, Tim Donaghy speaks out publicly for the first time, telling us why he bet on NBA games, how he won so often, and how his world collapsed. And what a world it was. It was your dream job. Yes. Why? I think I had an opportunity to uh, run up and down the floor with the greatest athletes in the world. I just love the game of basketball. Growing up, my goal was to somehow be a part of it. So everything was going just fine. It was a dream situation all around. And then you committed the cardinal sin. You started betting on NBA games, including games that you were refing yourself. Yes. What were you thinking? Obviously, I wasn't thinking to uh, cross that line. Why do you think you did it? Because I fell into an addiction of gambling. Uh, How did it begin? Playing golf at country clubs and card games in country clubs and people's houses. And it just evolved from those type of situations to betting on athletic contests. From card games to athletic contests to the NBA. Yes. Donaghy was betraying everything he and his family stood for. His father had been a respected ref in college basketball. Tim followed in his footsteps and went even further, making it to the NBA. But Tim said betting was more powerful than all of that, and winning was ecstasy. And did betting on the NBA give you a higher high than betting on other sports? I think it gave me a higher high because I was able to predict the outcome of the games. And I think when you talk about gambling and the euphoria that comes with it, um, making winning picks is what excites you. Euphoria, real euphoria. Mm -hmm. And as far as you know, you were the only ref who was placing bets? As far as I understand, yes. How many games did you bet on? I think I bet on probably over 100 games. Over 100. And how many of those were you reffing yourself? Uh, a lot. And here's what you may find difficult to believe. Donaghy says that while his betting may have been illegal, his reffing was always honest. You're insisting that your betting did not influence the way you called a game. Why should we believe you? Because the FBI did a thorough investigation, and even the NBA concluded that um, I did not fix games in the NBA. That's right. A 29-year FBI veteran, Special Agent Philip Scala, led the investigation of Donaghy. He told us that Donaghy convinced him. He said, knowing the information that I had, I didn't have to do anything on the court to pick a winner. I could pick a winner 80% of the time just knowing what I knew an hour before the game. And watching the tapes, we could see that there was never something outlandish where you could see he called a foul or he omitted a foul because he wanted to see certain team win. We never saw that. The NBA's investigation came to the same surprising conclusion. Quote, it seems plausible to us that Donaghy may not have manipulated games. We are unable to contradict the government's conclusion. When you were refing a game, didn't it come to your mind that you'd bet on one team and not on the other? I tried to put it out of my mind, and, and I think that, that I was able to do that. In one game, you were betting on San Antonio, but you threw their coach, Greg Popovich, out of the game. And now, Greg Popovich has been tossed. Uh, I didn't think about the bet during the game, and in my mind, he needed to be ejected. Losing their coach cost San Antonio the game and cost Donaghy his bet. But that didn't happen very often. Donaghy claims, and the FBI concurs, that he won 70 to 80 percent of his NBA bets. He told the FBI, this is a quote, you don't realize how easy this was for me knowing what I know. Mm -hmm. What exactly did you know? I knew that there were certain relationships that existed between referees and players, referees and coaches, and referees and owners that um, influenced the 
point spreads in games. What's a point spread? A point spread is where a team is favored to win or lose by a certain amount of points. You say that certain refs like or dislike certain players, certain coaches, certain general managers, and certain owners. You told us, I knew these guys, knew who they liked, who they despised, and who they would help or screw over. For example, Donaghy cited tempestuous superstar Allen Iverson. Some refs liked him, some did not. Natural enough. But Donaghy said several refs would let their feelings influence their calls by either favoring Iverson or favoring his opponents. And that would affect the score. And I knew those relationships, whether they were positive or negative, had an effect on the game. So you knew when Iverson was playing and you knew which refs were, were there, you knew whether to bet on the Iverson team or on the other team? Yes. Iverson wouldn't talk to us. He didn't want refs to get mad at him. But his manager told us that the way the refs were treating him, some for, some against, made him sick. I do believe Alan Iverson knew this, and I believe all the players know this, that certain referees treat them much better than others. Donaghy told us that two years ago, Iverson had incurred the wrath of the refs. He had threatened one of our officials, and the NBA fined him $25,000, and we felt as a group that he should have been suspended. And because he wasn't, we felt like we would teach him a lesson. During that time, you worked an Iverson game January 6, 2007, so you bet against Iverson's team. Correct. Because you knew that all the refs were gunning for him. This was openly discussed. Openly discussed. And I knew that the other two referees and I sought out to uh, do a little justice of our own. The refs quickly called curious fouls on Iverson, including rarely called fouls for palming. And Iverson still upset about that palming call. They threw his game off and his team lost. According to the game's announcers, even late in the game, you kept hurting Iverson's team by letting defenders bludgeon him without calling any fouls. Watch. Tim Dunning will not call a foul when Iverson goes to basket. About three in a row where he got the basket, got fouled, we thought, no call. What are we looking at? We're looking at a foul that was let go. Obviously, uh, in the pregame meetings, we came to the conclusion that we were not going to give Allen Iverson any um, marginal plays to the basket. And that absolutely should have been called a foul that I and the other referees passed on. Did anyone in the NBA know about it? There was a group supervisor at the game that came in at halftime who was laughing and stated that he felt that Iverson had gotten the message. So the supervisor approved of your punishing Iverson? Yes. The NBA would not let that supervisor or any of its refs talk to us. In that game, Donaghy did make calls that helped him win his bet, but he insists that wasn't the point. He says all he wanted to do was punish Iverson. But yes, he did win his bet. Special Agent Philip Scala, who retired from the FBI last year, told us Donaghy would bet on a game when he knew who the refs were and that they felt strongly about certain players. What does that tell you about how certain refs call games? Most of the refs, we believed, were honest in calling the game as they had seen it. There was this aspect of judgment. A person should understand his bias and make sure he leaves that on the sideline. But obviously that wasn't the case, or else Donaghy wouldn't have been picking 80% of the games. There, there seemed to be some bleeding in that, in that area. Some bleeding sounds to me like an understatement. Well, it could be. Now, you say that Donaghy cooperated with you. If he had lied to you, he would have faced a much longer sentence, no? Yeah, so long as he was completely honest and omitted nothing, the FBI would stand by him. If we ever found out that there was a lie, that cooperation agreement would be ripped up. And that never and happened? That never happened. Donaghy told the FBI and us that NBA headquarters inadvertently helped him pick winners by sending refs instructions before a game. For example, he says he won several bets in a row by putting his money on the Los Angeles Lakers because he knew the league was going to favor their star, Kobe Bryant. He knew it 
because the Lakers had complained that refs had missed calling fouls on defenders who'd been blocking Bryant. The Lakers had sent in a CD of 25 plays that um, they felt calls were missed when Kobe Bryant went to the basket. And I understood from the NBA office that 22 of those plays were missed by the referees. And I knew that Kobe Bryant was basically going to be given uh, the opportunity to go to the foul line of somebody as much as breathe on him. The NBA says its instructions to refs are meant to improve officiating. But Donaghy says those directives made it easy for him to pick winners. Because it was inside information along the lines of knowing that a, a certain stock was going to be bought out before the opening bell in the stock market. So it's, it's you know, almost a guarantee. Here's more of what you did. You would telephone reps who were about to officiate a game and pump them for information before the game. What kind of information are you looking for? If there was a situation where there was a payback in order from a previous game. Injuries? Injuries certainly played a factor of just little gossip conversations that I would use in making a pick. But the other refs did not know that you were using this information to place bets? No. So you were betraying your fellow referees? Unfortunately, yes. One former ref who feels betrayed is Mike Mathis, who used to head the referees' union. He told us that refs speak openly among themselves about their personal prejudices. In locker rooms, okay, referees do talk about players. You know, if a guy is sitting there saying he don't like so-and-so and this guy does this and he won't, you know, keep his mouth shut, da-da-da-da-da, I can see where he could take that information and use it. But Mathis says he was stunned that Donaghy actually did use it to place bets. And what do you think of what Donaghy did? It's reprehensible. Um, uh, it took a career of mine, 25 years, and sort of washed it down the toilet. So it, Donaghy really spoiled the reputation of all of you guys? No doubt. Mike Mathis is a man you respect, right? Sure. Mathis said your betting on NBA games was reprehensible. You agree? Absolutely. But did you feel that you were doing something wrong? Sure, but obviously it was, it was easy and it was exciting, and uh, I th actually didn't realize the consequences of my actions. You didn't know that you were do doing something that could get you into trouble? Uh, obviously it was in the back of my head, but I think you just go with the notion that you're not going to be caught. You thought you could get away with it? Yes. And Donaghy might well have gotten away with it, he might still be refing and betting today, but he fell in with the mob. How the mob brought him down when we come back. Tim Donaghy, the NBA ref who bet on games he officiated, was placing those bets through a friend. He was too scared of getting caught to do it himself and their winning streak went on uninterrupted for three years. But in the fourth year, that friend let slip that he was getting his betting tips from an NBA ref. The mob found out about it and wanted in on the action. That's when Donaghy discovered what it means to be really scared. It started outside this hotel in Philadelphia. The FBI says two men associated with the Gambino crime family requested a meeting with Donaghy. They took him for a ride. They came down and picked me up. They picked you up? Mm hmm And what happened then? They basically told me that I needed to give them the picks, and if I didn't, that um, it's a possibility that somebody would go down and visit my wife and kids in Florida. Wow. And you believed them? Yes. Were you scared? Sure. From then on, his picks were relayed to the mob. And how did you communicate your bets? I would uh, discuss it with a high school friend of mine who would pass the information along to them. And was there a code? Yes. The code was if I wanted them to bet the home team, I would discuss his brother uh, Chuck. And if I wanted him to bet the visiting team, I would mention his brother Johnny. Do you have any notion how much the mob made off of Donaghy? The FBI is very, very conservative in those aspects. We felt comfortable saying it was at least a few million dollars. At least a few million. Conservatively, that went into the coffers of organized crime. 
And how much were you making? I was making $2,000 per correct pick. $2,000 per correct pick. That seems like peanuts if they were making millions. It was. Why didn't you ask for more money? Uh, it wasn't about the money at that point. It wasn't about the money. It was just about getting through the season and hoping that it ended. Because the mob put a lot of money on his picks, they were not good losers. We told you that in one game, Donaghy threw out the coach of the team they were betting on. That cost the mob the bet, and they were not happy. They had questions as to why I did it. And what did you tell them? I just told them that I wasn't making calls in games to in influence the outcome, and you know I'm not going to be able to obviously predict the winner every night. And you know they have to accept that that's what's going to happen. Did the mob accept that? I'm not sure that they accepted it or not, but that was the information that I passed to them. As it turned out, his mob connection brought him down. The FBI, which was monitoring mob phone calls, heard that an NBA ref was betting on games. The information made it to Special Agent Philip Scala, who headed the FBI's Gambino Family Task Force. One of the case agents had come into my office and said that they had information from a wiretap stating that there was huge sums of money being made and that someone thought that a ref may be involved. So you got to Donaghy through the mob, really? Uh, yeah. So if you hadn't gotten involved with the mob, you might still be out there refing and betting on your own games? Possibly. So your big mistake was getting involved with the mob? No, my, my big mistake was crossing that line and where I, I bet uh, in the first place. Tell me about the moment that you realized that the FBI knew that you'd be betting on NBA games. A sickening feeling, you know? The realization of that happening was just sickening. And once you were caught, you decided to come clean and cooperate. Why? I knew I did something that was obviously a bad choice, and uh, I decided that moving forward, it was not only in my best interest, but my family's best interest to try and cut my losses. You call it a bad choice. Isn't that something of an understatement? Sure. Uh, it was a horrible choice. He cooperated with the FBI to get a lighter sentence, but that exposed him to some dark problems. Were you contacted by anyone in the mob? There were uh, threats made to my home phone. What kind of threats did you receive? Death threats. What did they say? That uh, I was going to be killed. Did you believe them? I wasn't sure. Donaghy was sentenced to one year in prison, where he found he was not safe from the mob. He was threatened, then attacked. There was one guy who claimed that he was associated with the mob and that he was going to get a gun and uh, eventually blow my head off and break my kneecaps. His head was untouched, but months later, one knee still needs therapy. He whacked me with a stick and, and did some damage to my knee. And now that he's out, he is still worried about retribution from the mob. Well, certainly it's in the back of my mind, and, but uh, I'm not going to live my life in fear. But I was informed by the FBI agents that they certainly had an eye on what they called these wise guys, and that if anything would come up, they would inform me immediately. Do you believe that you will be protected? Yes, I do. Convicted of wire fraud and passing betting tips across state lines, Donaghy spent 11 months of his sentence in prison and was released last month. He could well have been sentenced to more than five years if he hadn't cooperated. His two mob cohorts, Thomas the Doctor Martino and James the Sheep Batista, denied ever threatening Donaghy and got sentences of 15 months and one year. Donaghy not only confessed his own sins to the FBI, he also blew the whistle on the NBA. He claimed that in the playoffs, the NBA does everything possible to extend series and to help big market teams advance. Longer playoffs with those chosen teams mean more money for the NBA. The NBA denies it and says Donaghy was making wild allegations hoping to reduce his sentence. Commissioner David Stern declined to speak with us. He didn't want the league to participate in a report about Donaghy. NBA Commissioner David Stern and other referees say that you have no credibility. You are a convicted felon not to be trusted. They say refs are professional, and all this stuff about their personal feelings influencing the way they call games is nonsense. 
I would say they have a very valid point, but I would again point back to the investigation uh, that the FBI conducted and um, the fact that I was 100% truthful with them. The FBI said that they believed you, that you were honest, but that does not necessarily mean that you're correct. You may have believed the NBA was tilting the play playing field, but that doesn't mean that they actually did so. I would answer that with the fact that I was still able to pick the games at a uh, 70 to 80% correct rate. But how much do you think you made in total? Over the course of four years, betting on NBA games, I think I probably profited around $100,000. Where's that money today? Some of it's at casinos, some of it's uh, paid off football debts, some of it's uh, paid off luxury items for our house. Now Donaghy has written a book titled Personal Foul, published by the VTI Group after Random House dropped it. It's about his betting scandal and his allegations against the NBA. But the league is striking back. They keep trying to paint me as the rogue referee. We think we have here a rogue, isolated criminal. Aren't you the rogue referee? I mean, I certainly made some terrible choices to do what I did, but the culture that existed within the game of the NBA uh, enabled me to be able to do this at a very successful rate. You said that to you, basketball represented discipline, tradition, fairness, and integrity. You betrayed all of that, didn't you? Yes, I did. Have you learned to live with yourself? It's tough. But you brought it on yourself. I certainly did. What is the moral of your story? What message are you trying to put out? We all have choices to make in life. Um, and when we decide to go down that wrong road, um, it'd be better off backing up and realizing that not only do you affect your life with some terrible choices, but the lives of people you love the most, and that's your family. How did it affect your family? Roland did. His wife divorced him, and she has custody of their four daughters. Ironically, Donaghy says his scandal has actually improved NBA officiating because the league has made various changes to prevent refs from letting their biases influence their calls. Are you still watching basketball? I haven't watched a game uh, in two years. You were involved in it for how many years? My whole entire life. What do you think would happen if you turned on your TV and watched a basketball game? I would wish that I was out on the floor refereeing it. And that's something that you'll never do again? No. Yes, our March Madness brackets are already a mess, too. But here's one safe prediction for the 2019 NCAA basketball tournament that tipped off this week. It will feature more wagering than ever before. That's because last year, the Supreme Court overturned a federal law and ruled that it is up to the states to decide whether they want to legalize sports gambling. New Jersey led the way, many more followed, and more are planning too soon. This shift will bring a windfall to bookmakers, sports leagues, and states' tax revenues. But at what cost? This is the first year of widely legalized sports gambling, but 2019 also marks another milestone, the 100-year anniversary of the Chicago Black Sox scandal, when a team in the clutches of gambling mobsters threw the World Series. It's a reminder that, you might say, there's no such thing as a free hunch. And away we go. Morsell gives it up. Oh! Thursday's opening day of March Madness provided a feast for college basketball fans. 16 games in one day and another 16 on tap the next. Oh, the Euro! A major <laughs> highlight. Super teams, Cinderella's, and nail-biting finishes. Queen, corner three at the buzzer. Air ball, and Auburn hangs on. But for all the familiar trappings, this year brought a new wrinkle. Hit it, baby! Yeah! On Thursday, gamblers thronged FanDuel's New Jersey Sportsbook. Think of a sports bar where you can bet on anything. People also put money down on total points scored, which highly seeded team will lose soonest, even whether a team with a tiger mascot will make the Final Four. Next is LSU. Some wagers were made with a clerk at a betting window. 
More were made on mobile phone apps with just a tap and a swipe. And some of those bets were made on games as they were being played. It's estimated that March Madness generated $10 billion in gambling last year. Yes, $10 billion. Virtually all of it through illegal bookies or offshore websites. You have an event like the NCAA tournament, one of the most wagered upon sports events of the year. You got to think more money is going to be wagered this year than ever before. The amount that we can measure will certainly be, be much larger. Ryan Rodenberg is a law professor at Florida State with a specialty in sports gambling. Make like a bookmaker, set a line. By the end of the year, how many states have some form of legalized sports gambling? By the end of the year, there'll be 15 states that have some form of sports betting and probably a dozen more that have passed a law but just haven't put it into effect yet. So by 2020, more than half the states will have some form of legalized sports gambling. Yes. And as legalized gambling spreads across the country, Rodenberg says unpaid college athletes are ripe targets for unscrupulous bettors. The typical uh, situation in terms of bribing someone to, to shave some points, you just don't see that at the, the, the high level, professional level. But the one area where you do see it, and there's countless examples, is in college sports, pr particularly college basketball. There's people that will do what they need to do to make a buck at the expense of an 18 or 19 year old kid. Mike Hamrick is athletic director at Marshall University in West Virginia, one of the first states to legalize sports gambling after the Supreme Court ruling. You can give your athletes tuition, scholarship, room and board, but you can't pay them. And someone comes along and says, here's a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars to corrupt a game, they're susceptible, you're saying. It's very tempting. It's very tempting. It's not like Gambling on sports hasn't existed before. Why are you so nervous this year as opposed to last year? It's right in front of my face, John. It's illegal. Hey, what's up, man? Hamrick made it clear that his worry is far from isolated. And most athletic directors that I've spoken with feel the same way. It's like, oh no, it's here. What do I do? Before coming to Marshall, Hamrick was athletic director at UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. At the time, the one place in America where sports gambling was legal. Right after he took the job there, Hamrick went to a home basketball game. UNLV was winning by what he thought was a comfortable margin. And the game was almost over. One of our players had a wide open layup and didn't take it. And the game's over and the fans booed. Fans and booed? Fans booed and my wife looked at me and said, this is really going to be a difficult job. We beat this team as bad as we did, and the fans want us to beat them worse. And I said, I don't know. And the guy beside me who was with me at the game said, that's not why the fans are unhappy. They're unhappy that if this young man would have made that layup, UNLV would have covered the point spread. So right then, I said to myself, this is something we got to keep an eye on. By now, he's had to build an entire infrastructure adding staff to monitor and protect his athletes. They can be compromised. Our job is to make sure they're not compromised. How do you do that? You educate them. You see a key player on your team driving a brand new car. You got to find out where that car came from. All right, guys, listen up. It isn't just gamblers trying to pay off players that Hamrick worries about. It's also gamblers seeking insider tip-offs from players and staff, particularly about injuries. That seems like a big challenge to keep those people from your players. Absolutely. And that little bit of information could make a big difference. I met with all our medical staff and absolutely no information's out there on injury, period. You don't tell your, your wives, you don't tell your brother-in-laws, you don't tell anybody. The talk of injuries and their impact on betting lines is still everywhere. Does the injury to Van Der Esch change how you would bet? You can't follow the sports match. these days like without hearing about picks. I'm all in on Dallas. The and odds. And who's fit to play and who's not. We hope everyone had a lovely Thanksgiving of wagering. It hasn't happened overnight, but gambling, long seen as a vice best kept at arm's length, is now embraced in popular culture. I love gambling. It's the best. <laughs> Ryan Rodenberg, the law professor, stresses that this is a huge shift from the days when every network in every sports league wanted nothing to do with sports gambling. 
for decades it was, this could corrupt our product, this is going to pollute competition, and we can't have this. Exactly. And that was the consistent message that, that they said both in court and on Capitol Hill, that they needed to keep sports betting illegal. You want the spread or the money line? But as soon as the Supreme Court freed states to legalize sports betting last May, the pro leagues immediately reversed course. In sports terms, they transitioned from defense to offense. MGM Resorts will be the NBA's first official gaming partner. Um, Within months of the ruling, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the National Hockey League all made deals with MGM, and the NFL partnered up with Caesars Palace. It's amazing how quickly the landscape uh, has shifted. Joe. Joe Asher is the U.S. CEO of William Hill, a British-based company that runs the biggest sports gambling operation in Nevada and aspires to do the same in every state that legalizes. It was about 15 years ago when the city of Las Vegas wanted to buy advertising on the Super Bowl, and that commercial was turned down. So to go from that to having the Oakland Raiders moving to Las Vegas in a stadium that's right behind Mandalay Bay is just a stunning uh, shift. High fives everywhere. <laughs> no surprise, it's a shift driven by dollars. Recent research by the American Gaming Association found that, perhaps contrary to stereotype, today's sports gamblers tend to be younger and wealthier and better educated than the population at large. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver was one of the first leaders in mainstream sports to see the economic opportunity. The data is clear that if somebody has a bet on a game, even a small bet, they're much more likely to engage in that match. They're much more likely to watch it. They're more likely to watch it for more minutes. They're more likely to be interested in the participants and to follow the sport. So there's no doubt there's a business component to this. A huge part of that business will be what's called in-play wagering, hundreds of options to bet during games. When you and I were kids, People bet an hour before the game or whenever and then waited for many hours for the game to be over. Now, people are betting constantly um, throughout a sports match. They're betting on quarter scores. They're betting on the, the, the amount of points a particular player will have in a quarter. In some cases, they're betting on free throws. Want to know where legalized sports gambling in America is headed? Look to professional soccer in Great Britain and Europe where in-play betting has been stitched into the fabric of that culture for years. Over there, the, the in-game, real-time betting, which is all technology enhanced, that's what the, the big deal is. In Europe, it's about 50%. And, and here, clearly, it's growing rapidly, and I think it'll continue to grow. I want, uh, and in this brave new betting world, Adam Silver claims that legal gambling is much more likely to be on the up and up than the old way with the neighborhood bookie. Make your case, why does legalized sports gambling, why, why do you think that decreases risk of corruption, not increases it? I think it decreases risk dramatically because we have access to the betting information. I think when you have an underground business operating in the shadows, you have no idea what people are betting on your own events. Because of technology, you can essentially get a fingerprint for every bet that's placed. You can detect unusual and unnatural line movements, bets. That technology can facilitate betting, but it can also facilitate detection. Absolutely. The proponents of legalized gambling say, listen, moving this into the sunlight is going to decrease risk, not increase it. You don't buy that. I don't buy that. Why no, that? no. What are they wrong? It's gambling. It can be handled to a certain extent, but nobody can sit here and tell you that they can deal with this and be 100% clean. Can't, they can't. That's at least partly because technology makes gambling much more accessible to many more people. In states where mobile betting is allowed, up to three quarters of all wagers are now made on phones. Just download an app, which by the way, can detect whether you're within state lines and start betting. So you're even sitting in the crowd in a Marshall basketball game, take out your phone and you can bet on the game you are watching. Absolutely. And the fact that people will bet on every detail of every game presents Mike Hamrick with one more reason to worry about how gamblers could corrupt college athletics. If you were an 18, 19 year old person from a difficult background and you didn't have a lot and someone put their arm around you and said, hey, you know, 
don't want Marshall to lose tonight, but you know, if it gets late in the game and it's two touchdowns, you know, miss a tackle, drop a pass, fumble. That can happen. It must scare the hell out of you. It does. It does. It scares Hemrick enough that he's giving the names of every one of his players and employees to every West Virginia casino and gambling operator to ensure that his people abide by the NCAA rules prohibiting any sports betting. Now that it is legal, what it did for you is put pressure on you as an athlete. Hamrick also regularly invites FBI agents to come to campus and speak to his athletes. Don't get involved. Walk away. They have to understand that if they get tied up with the wrong people, there are bad things that can happen. Scare straight. Well, I, I, I don't want to sit here and tell you we, we're going to try to scare our student athletes into not gambling, but we are.